Have you ever wondered how to make your code work for instances that you don't know much about? Do you have a customer facing app, but you cannot control the customer data inputs and wonder how to code in a way that can handle this customer data? In this video, Salesforce application engineer, Adam Olshansky, teaches us how to write highly generalized code using Dynamic Apex and the tooling API. Welcome, it's Rachel and Jessica from 100 Days of Trailhead, the place where the tech community comes to learn Salesforce, learn tech, get inspired, have fun, and invest in ourselves. Whether you are brand new to learning Salesforce and starting from the beginning, or mid-career and skilling up for that new opportunity, we are your trail guides here to support you with an itinerary to help you get where you're going. You are in the right place. If you are new to our channel, make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons. Don't forget to click on the notification bell so you can be notified when we release a new video. In the description below, you can find links on everything we mention in this video in addition to links we find helpful like books that have helped us and our friends along our tech and Salesforce journeys. To find other helpful Salesforce and tech content, visit our blog at 100daysoftrailhead.com. In this video, Adam Olshansky discusses writing generalized code that works for instances that you don't know much about and or have little control in terms of customer data inputs. Adam Olshansky is a 14 times certified developer at Google and a Salesforce MVP. He is passionate about helping people to code on the Salesforce platform and enjoys giving back to the community. Your quest, should you choose to take it, is to journey with us through the adventure of learning Dynamic Apex and the Tooling API. Your quest begins now. All right, well, if y'all don't know, Adam is a Salesforce MVP, Certified Application and System Architect, and Platform Developer 2 Certified. He works as a Salesforce developer at YouTube who loves helping others learn how to code. He has been a Red Lemon coach for four times and has recently launched a course on Pluralsight. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, go purchase Pluralsight and give him, give him good feedback um, about the lightning, my, about migrating to lightning. So who doesn't need to know how to <laughs> migrate to lightning? Yeah, for <laughs> real. So give it up for Adam. Woo! Adam! Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> You're very welcome. All right. Uh, should I go ahead and get started then? Cool. All right. Uh, so thank you all for having me. Let me go share my screen here. All right. Um, so today we're going to be talking about writing highly genericized code. Uh, using Dynamic Apex and also tying that into the Tooling API. And uh, so as Rachel mentioned, I'm Adam Olshansky, a Salesforce MVP and developer at YouTube. Uh, I have a couple certifications and Trailhead badges. Um, but I think the real reason I'm here is one, I love teaching people to code. Um, I've been involved with groups like Rad Women. Um, I had the pleasure of being on a panel with Jessica uh, at the at the Witness Success last week. Last weekend, I guess. Um, and I really just love uh, uh, helping teach people to code and uh, very, very happy to be here today. All right, uh, so today we're gonna talk about kind of three major things. Um, the first one is gonna be kind of what this concept is of generic code in Apex. Uh, we're gonna walk through some uh, generic and dynamic coding examples. And then we're gonna get into the tooling API, how you can actually use some of this genericized way of coding uh, to build tools on Salesforce. And so to get started, generic programming in Apex, uh, a lot of different people can benefit from generic coding. Uh, most common being ISV developers, where you may be developing an application for some org that you don't necessarily know the configuration of. You don't know what the conditions are. You don't know what features they've enabled. You don't know what other packages they've installed. You don't know what sort of custom objects they're working with, and you want to make sure your application and your code is still going to work there. 
if you do have a specific org, though, you still may not always know what the input's going to be. You could have a customer-facing application that a customer could be putting in some sort of string of data. You don't necessarily know exactly what it's going to be. So you need to have your code generic enough that it can interpret it accordingly. Maybe depending on who it is or where they are, what they're inputting, you may need to create an account. For another situation, you may just want to create a contact. So being able to do both of those simultaneously without having to duplicate your code is very beneficial. And really, any sort of developer that's accepting user input, uh, generic code and dynamic code makes it a lot easier to write queries based on certain conditions and kind of have your code run in different ways based on the specific scenario. All right, so what problem are we solving for? Ultimately, uh, something that kind of looks like this. Right. Basically, you've probably seen code that's not really solving the right issue, right? There's a solution in place, but it could definitely be improved. The code might be rigid or fragile, uh, has poor reusability, so you have to end up repeating yourself, violating kind of the you know dry, don't repeat yourself mantra. Uh, your code may need a lot of patches and quick fixes to get it working. Uh, you have to duplicate your code, maybe a couple hundred lines for account, the same couple hundred lines for contact just because it's a different object. And so something that generic code can solve for. Uh, another thing we might find are overly complicated data structures, maps of maps of maps, where we get really you know, embedded into large data structures that are hard to use, hard to read, hard to maintain, uh, and contain a bunch of different types of objects because you can't put them all into a specific, uh, a single list, for example. All right, so just kind of to, to set the stage, uh, basically two primary ways of writing code. Uh, the static that you're probably all familiar with in this example here, I'm selecting some fields from account, for example, or the name might be in a set of ID or in a set of strings, and the value is less than 5,000. Uh, but there's also kind of what we're talking about today, the more dynamic generic way, right? What if the requirement changes and the value that we're looking for for that specific instance isn't 5,000 anymore? Or what if we want to take an input of names but change it slightly somewhere else in the code? So we can write the code more dynamically where we're kind of building the query as it's going on. Maybe there aren't any names, so there wouldn't be an account set necessarily. And so you see in the dynamic example here, somebody entered a bunch of names, and so we're taking that list of names and we're adding that to the query. We're then checking to see if there was a value entered. Maybe we don't want to filter it at all, maybe we do. Uh, but depending on what that filter is, if it exists, we can include or exclude that part of the query as well. You see on the bottom there, if they entered a number value that they want to uh, filter on for our custom value field, we can input that directly in the query accordingly. And then using database.query to run our uh, query, it'll take a string parameter that we can still run the same software query and get back our list of accounts but we're able to do it in a more dynamic way that can respond to user input, whether or not it exists accordingly. All right, so some of the benefits of static code, uh, or some of the, I guess, not benefits necessarily, but some of the features of static code, it's generated at compile time. It is, so when you save the code, you're gonna find out if there are any errors. Uh, things are hard coded, like we saw in the previous example where the value was 5,000. It uh, doesn't usually have any dependencies, so we assume we know what's there. We assume there's a value field. We know there's going to be, you know, a set of names that we're looking at. Uh, and it works very well if you know exactly what's in your org. So if you have your org and you're developing for your org, this can work very well. And so, as we said, most commonly used by developers at a company that are developing for their own org, but they know exactly what's there or they're adding new things accordingly. Dynamic and generic code, though, is generated at runtime. So in my query here, I'm just generating a string. So this string could be anything. So I can save it, even if it's going to break, and I'm not going to find out it's going to break until the code actually starts running. Uh, it's dependent on user input. So as we saw, we could take an input uh, to use as our value uh, where clause. Uh, we may have org-specific dependencies. So, you know, maybe the value field exists, maybe it doesn't we may be able to uh, check that accordingly. And so really it works very well if you don't necessarily know what's in the org. And we'll see another example of that in a little bit where we can check for certain features. 
uh, most commonly used by developers whose code needs to run customized orgs, but it can also be used by developers who are working on a single org that want to do the same thing with a couple different S objects, for example. If I had the same process for accounts, the same process for contacts, maybe some similar fields, I could very easily repurpose this string query here to either filter on, uh, run a SQL query on account or contact, a set of account fields or a set of contact fields without having to redo all the rest of the code down below. Right, so some of the trade-offs, uh, as we saw, our static code was a nice two lines. It was the query and then the return statement, whereas the dynamic code was a little bit more. So more code to write, which also means more code to test and less readability. Uh, just the nature of having more code and a lot of different conditions. The positives, though, there's more detailed information. There's potentially less chance of an error down the road because we're checking for various things along the way. And ultimately, endless possibilities about what you can do. I can build any sort of query about anything using my dynamic sock wall versus the static sock wall that I have to hard code in place. All right, so now we're going to walk through a couple examples of what dynamic coding looks like in practice. Uh, so some of the things you may be familiar with, you may not, but some are kind of the tools of the trade for writing this dynamic and generic code. Uh, you may be familiar with custom settings or custom metadata. I can save a value in a custom setting that I can reference later. I can create a bunch of different values in my custom metadata that I can again reference in my code, and I can make changes accordingly without having to edit my code every time. Uh, the schema class we're going to see in a little bit is very valuable for being able to query the metadata in your org. So you can use the schema class to check what are the S objects in your org, what are the fields on those S objects, what are the field types, what are the field names, what are the pickles values on the field on your S objects, and go all the way down the tree that way. Uh, there's also dynamic apex, which we saw a little bit of writing kind of on the fly SQL queries. There's dynamic visual force, which again, depending on the fields in uh, a controller, for example, we can display them accordingly on a visual force page. Dynamic SQL we looked at also. And then the limits class, which is pretty cool and allows you to check your limits as the code is running. Uh, I frequently use it in test classes, for example, to check how many queries I've run. But potentially, you may have a scenario where you want to run certain processes if you're not going to max out your queries. Or if you are about to max out your queries, you can send an email to someone to notify them accordingly. So check in real time as the code is executing, what are your limits on software queries and how close are you reaching it? What are your limits on DML statements, how close are you reaching it? Stuff like that. So dynamic apex, uh, there's an example here using the schema class. So I have a string. Uh, just a generic you know, string array with two items in it, account and merchandise underscore underscore C. And I'm going to make a call to the schema class to get some information about the S objects whose names are in my string array. And so if I were to run this, I'd see I got information for two objects. I can then iterate over the results, get the label of each of the S objects. I can get how many fields are in each of the S objects. I can check to see whether or not an S object is custom. And I can get child relationships based on those objects. For example, if I were to run this on account, I see it has a couple child relationships. So again, useful when you're figuring out potentially what is in an org that you've never seen before. A dynamic apex where it comes to data, uh, Salesforce released this functionality, I think, two or three releases ago. Uh, but there's a way to get just the values that have data populated. So I create a new account. I could have a couple hundred fields on account. But by just uh, inserting that account and checking the fields that I put in values for, I can call get populated fields as an app. And it'll only return the values uh, for fields that have data in them. So in this case, if I were to run this, I'd see my Output would be the name field has a value of test map account two, the phone field has a value, the ID field has a value. And so potentially when I'm running code, I can easily check, okay, is this field in this key set or not, and uh, execute my code accordingly. Uh, for visual force, probably not used as much anymore, but same sort of principle here. I have a custom object called book that I can run a uh, 
schema dot s object type command on and get all the fields in my book class or my book object rather. And then I can go check to see if those fields are accessible by the current user and whether or not they're custom fields to filter out a lot of the created date and last modified date and things like that. And I can add them to a list. And once I get those available fields, I can then return them to a Visual Force page that looks something like this, where again, I'm getting all those values of fields and I can display the labels and uh, field values accordingly. Uh, we saw a database.query a little bit earlier when we were talking about dynamic SQL. Uh, so this is a use case where I'm installing uh, my package in a customer org. They may or may not have lead record types available. So my first query, if I select record type ID from leads and the org hasn't enabled record types for leads, they're going to get an error message. Whereas in the uh, example down below, we see we're going to check to see if the lead object has a record type ID field. If so, we'll include it in our SQL query. If not, we'll just query for ID and we can ignore that functionality accordingly. So again, very useful when we don't necessarily know what's in an org, we don't necessarily know what features people have enabled and things of that nature. Uh, the limits class, as I mentioned, kind of similar. We can do a lot of different things based on where the limits are in real time. So I can make these calls, again, very helpful in uh, test classes, but can be used in regular Apex code as well. Uh, you can learn about all the different kind of limits examples at Bitly Apex Limits class, but the most common ones used are get DML rows, get DML statements, get heap size, get queries, and get query rows. Uh, I believe get queries will tell you how many, uh, yeah, like how many queries you've run, get query rows, and how many records you've queried for, and things like that. And so it's a way to dynamically check how close am I to my limits uh, so I can figure out where I'm potentially running into an issue. All right. Uh, so we've seen some examples of writing generic code and designing apps where we don't necessarily know what's in an org potentially. And we've also walked through some of the examples of how to find information about metadata for a particular org. So what are the objects in your org? What are the fields on those objects? Things like that. The obvious question is, what do we do with all this, right? And so that's where the tooling API comes into play. And so at its core, the tooling API was built as an API for building tools, right? How do you figure out what's in your org? You're a brand new admin, brand new developer coming into an org. How do you quickly figure out what's there, what can be used, things like that? And so potentially you can build a tool that could help somebody solve a problem like that. All right, so we're gonna walk through uh, a couple uh, demos in a second here, uh, but just some highlights in the tooling API. So as I mentioned, used to build tools. I can query all the metadata in my org from uh, S objects and things like that, but also Apex classes, Apex triggers, and tests. And I can go down to the level of what variables are in a specific class. I can go down to the level of where are these variables used in which class. I can do things about setup objects and get information on business processes, flows, custom items, workflow components, things of that nature. I can go create and check metadata containers to check on deployments in real time. Uh, I can query using either SOAP or REST. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the metadata API, and the tooling API was kind of built as metadata API plus plus, right? A lot of the same functionality, but a bunch of additional stuff as well that you don't get with the metadata API. And all right, so let's walk through uh, an example here. Um, so I'm going to go into Workbench. And uh, I'm going to copy this code here. And if I look at my org, I see I have a couple classes here. And I did not upgrade this org to Lightning yet, unfortunately. But I see all these classes I have in here. And I'm going to create a new class from the tooling API. So I'm going to go navigate to Workbench and go to the REST Explorer. 
and I need to navigate to tooling S objects Apex class. So tooling S objects Apex class. Uh, I do a post. And I'm doing a very simple Apex class. The name is going to be called my new tooling class. And the body is just going to be blank uh, signature public class, my new tooling class. And so I'm going to go ahead and execute that. Uh, I'm going to do some parser error because of these quotes. Let me correct that real quick. And we'll try to run this again. And we should see a new class got created with this ID. And so when I go refresh this now, we should see my new tooling class get created uh, just a minute ago here. And we can go in and we see it was created uh, just an empty class. And you see it was created with the API version of whatever we made the call out with. So in our case, we made it with version 43. So we were able to create an Apex class on the fly uh, with a call to the tooling API. Uh, some other things I can do with the tooling API, I can take a look at all the different objects uh, from the metadata perspective in an org. So I'm going to go back and uh, do a get for this one. Uh, it doesn't really matter about the version number. It's uh, a bit of an older deck, so the version number is a little bit behind. But you can see I have Apex classes in here with some information about Apex classes, the prefix for Apex classes. Uh, if I go down a little more, I have Apex triggers, some information about Apex triggers. Uh, I can go check and I can see uh, some dashboard settings in here, email templates, uh, field sets, field mappings, flows, flow definitions. And uh, go all the way down. I see some stuff about users, user roles, workflow information as well. So a lot of the setup objects, you can tell uh, what's in an org, potentially valuable looking at feature sets and things like that. Um, it can also gather some information there. Uh, a little bit more interesting, I can look at the Apex manifest. And this will tell me all the Apex classes in my org. And so I see uh, I have all these classes here, including the My New Tooling class I just created. Um, this is also nice because it shows you all the kind of inner classes. So I have an inner class called Apex class. That's part of a class called Tooling API. And so we see the uh, Tooling API class here, and then this inner class of the Tooling API called Apex class. Um, and so I also created a class called WWDG Trigger Create that we'll demo in a second as well. That's there. Uh, so this is kind of nice if I want to potentially display what are all the classes in this org in a nice visual manner. Uh, the last thing we can do, I'm going to jump over to this other org. Uh, so a while back, I put together a uh, trailhead leaderboard. And so I have a uh, class here that hopefully will be open. Nope. Uh, called... I'll hit leaderboard class, I believe. Okay, leaderboard controller. And uh, so I see a bunch of information here. Now the constructor has a bunch of variables, uh, some methods, things like that. Wrapper classes. Uh, I can go make a query again in the REST Explorer. Sign me out here. I'll make a query for that specific class. And it'll, it'll give me a bunch of information about the class. So it'll give me the name of the class. It'll actually give me the entire class body, which isn't particularly interesting. Um, but the real interesting part here down here is the symbol table. And the symbol table will tell me what are the constructors in the class, what external references are in the class, what inner classes do I have. Uh, my internet wants to work. It'll tell me what methods I have in the class. Uh, so it's a contact wrapper, which potentially could have its own constructors. We see methods in the class, an init method. Uh, I was implementing a standard set controller, so I have first class, previous, next. Uh, some of the standard visual course actions like cancel, uh, all the properties in my class, all the variables in my class. Uh, I repeated myself a lot, as you can see. Uh, and it'll actually tell you where in the code these variables reside. 
And so you can potentially run queries on an org or display all this information about a certain class. Where are things showing up? Uh, maybe you notice that something's there but isn't referenced anywhere. Uh, that potentially could be use, uh, useful as well. All right. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is uh, so we showed uh, how we can write Apex using the tooling API, which is great. Uh, but now I'm going to use Apex, dynamic Apex, to write Apex using Apex, little Apexception, if you will. Uh, and so what I've done here is I downloaded a uh, open source GitHub package that allows you to implement the tooling API in Apex. That's what you saw. I had the tooling API class. And I put it in a class called WWDG Trigger Create. So if I do a refresh here, you see this org is completely devoid of any triggers. And we're going to go ahead and change that using Apex. And so here I'm running a get global describe on my org to get all of the objects. And I'm just sorting them in alphabetical order because I can. <laughs> uh, and then here uh, we could, if we wanted to, create triggers for all the objects. Because some of the objects don't support triggers, we're going to hard code a couple of values uh, just for example's sake. So I'm going to look for when the string that I'm getting is account contact or opportunity. Uh, and when it is, I'm going to run using the schema class uh, and fields.getMap. I'm going to get a list of all the fields on that S object. And I'm going to concatenate them all into a string. Once I have that, I'm going to construct a JSON. And so I'm going to name my trigger uh, tooling account trigger. So every object name, tooling account trigger, tooling opportunity trigger, specify which object it's on. Uh, and then the body is just going to be trigger, tooling account trigger on account. Uh, we're going to make them all before insert. That can, we can be whatever we want. And for very, right now, I'm just going to do a very generic trigger that does nothing and just has a competent outline of all the fields on that object. I'm going to make a call out to the tooling API uh, via the Apex class we installed. Uh, do a post to the org, and it'll create my trigger. So we saw there were no triggers in the org. I'm going to go run this now. And let me move this out of the way so we can see our uh, blog here. So we see it uh, ran and got a list of all the objects in my org uh, and cut it off at some point and started creating all the triggers here. Tooling account, trigger, or tooling account, tooling contact, tooling opportunity with the body of what all the fields are on those objects. And you see we got some uh, successful status codes here. So I'll go refresh this. And sure enough, we see three brand new triggers, each on the object we wanted it to be on. And as I mentioned, it's just a long trigger that has a commented outline of all the fields on that object. So account has, billing street, billing state, so on and so forth. Uh, if we look at opportunity, we're going to see uh, account ID, amount, probability, things like that. So pretty cool I was able to do all that. Uh, some of the other tools you can build, uh, we're going to demo one more here, actually, another uh, package you can install off GitHub. Uh, so we have our uh, couple classes in here. I have a generic interface. Uh, I have a generic base class that can be virtually implemented with some virtual methods. And then I have a demo class, which extends the base class and implements the interface. And it has its own properties here, has a bunch of constructors and classes. And so it has a bunch of information here. And then I can go to this page called the Documenter. And it'll actually uh, display all the information about all these classes. So that interface we had, it'll tell you, OK, there's a public uh, demo interface declaration in line uh, one. Uh, line two, it'll have an abstract method called demo interface method. No constructors and properties in that one. Our base class, again, we see uh, something similar, a couple different uh, modifiers, public virtual and with sharing. We had a constructor. We have a couple different methods, a couple of which were virtual, and uh, some variables in there. So we have a st uh, string variable called value. And then our class had implemented all that. Again, we have a ton of properties. We can see where each of those are referenced. Uh, we can see variables that aren't referenced anywhere. 
uh, got table decorations, constructors, methods, variables, and where all those variables are referenced. So we can see just from some very basic classes, we can tell, okay, what's not being used where and uh, what sort of structure does this particular class or series of classes have. And so this you can download on GitHub. I can provide a link to that if you want to play around with that as well. Uh, so some of the things you can build with uh, the tooling API, a uh, UML diagram tool. As we saw, we can query for all the objects in an org, and we can query all the child relationships on those objects. We can also query all the fields on each of the objects, and so we can kind of construct maybe a better looking version of a schema builder, for example. Uh, symbol table visualizer. So we walked through a little bit uh, querying into the metadata of a class and seeing potentially what it looks like in something like the documenter. So we can document an org a little bit better maybe. Uh, automated testing tools. If we have access to an org's metadata and we have access to all this information about uh, kind of creating a generic class, potentially deleting a class, do some testing on the fly, checking for limits and things of that nature. We saw uh, we have the ability to see where variables are referenced and where they're not, so maybe identifying unused code a little bit better. Uh, I know a lot of the uh, IDEs out there, including IntelliJ and uh, Maven's Mate, are using the tooling API when they're doing deployments or have the ability to use the tooling API for deployments, so you can query various deployments and check on those. Uh, you can customize managed package based on an org's config. So maybe I want every object to have a certain field value. I can potentially create all those fields on install in a script that runs, something like that. Uh, and ultimately, use your imagination. There's an endless number of things you can potentially do, having the ability to see all of the org's S objects, all of the org's code, all of the org's uh, systems and processes going on uh, through code and through this API. Uh, you can do a lot of cool things in terms of tools to build. Uh, great. So what are the next steps uh, kind of from here? So ultimately, uh, kind of part of the purpose was thinking about the right type of code for the app you're building, right? There are a lot of scenarios where static code is the best way to go, as we saw, a little bit more readable, uh, potentially easier to maintain, and very good for specific use cases. But at the same time, there are a lot of scenarios where it might be good to avoid repeating ourselves with a bunch of different uh, customizability and uh, dynamic capabilities that will allow us to write code only once. Uh, design patterns we didn't get too much into, um, it's something to look into as well, some general coding best practices, uh, dynamic code we talked about, uh, gather granular details to build any app. So we saw how deep we can get into an org in terms of what is in a specific class, what kind of fields are on a specific object, things like that. And really, the biggest next step is, is to get on there and go build, right? Part of uh, being a developer is, is always trying to build new things and a great opportunity, hopefully, uh, at some, uh, you can take away to go and do that. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the tooling API, Andy Fawcett, who uh, some of you may know, former CTO of Financial Force and now uh, VP of uh, Platform, I believe, at Salesforce, uh, has a whole section on his API dedicated to the tooling API. The tool I actually used to create the triggers on the fly was based on his and James Lothry's tooling API wrapper that you can download from GitHub. It'll basically put or give you the capabilities to make a call out to the tooling API from your org. Uh, Pat Patterson, a former Salesforce developer evangelist, also put something together that you can make a call out to the tooling API through Java if you're building an app off Salesforce and want to use the tooling API. Uh, and then the documenter that we saw as well, utilizing the symbol tables, uh, was presented at uh, Dreamforce 2013, uh, also available on GitHub, if you want to take a look at the source code for that. Uh, and so with that, uh, I just want to say thank you very much and uh, happy to take any questions. Right, don't be shy. Who's got questions? We all know you do. Oh, by the way, madam, um, we got a few comments in chat that uh, we've got a I love that by Sue Moss. We have a super cool by Tammy Lau. A uh, when you mentioned the uh, 
the resources. Sue said, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> we got a yell from Samantha uh, Bragg. So, um, oh, Sue asked, can you go back to the code of the documenter? Uh, please review a little more. Uh, sure. And feel free to chime in right. later. Uh, yeah, so I actually have not dug into the code too much, so we'll see what we're going to find in here. Uh, so Visual Force page, I'm um, using some JavaScript to make it look nice and pretty. Um, the actual, if I take away the, uh, the JavaScript here, um, it's actually a relatively simplistic class, looking at all the Apex class members um, and using a Visual Force component, simple table render component, and the Documenter controller. So let's look at the documenter controller real quick. Um, and that uh, relatively simple. Well, maybe not. Um, what's this doing here? So creating a set of the way. So this is doing a query Apex class members and the tooling API class. Um, we're looking for the metadata container ID equals current page ID. And I think that ID is being set on a hard code right now. Um, so when I refresh and take it away, it ends up with the same value. Um, but it's been selecting Apex class where name is like demo. Because that's how it picks those three classes. Uh, creates a metadata container. Um, creates Apex class members. Uh, retool to JavaScript to avoid 10 client limit. Uh, there's more stuff with Apex class members. I mean, the body, content entity ID, metadata container ID. Um, create container async request. And searching for container async request for metadata. Okay. Let's go see what our uh, component is doing. Might give us some more insight here. So open uh, components. So multi table render component. Okay. And so, okay. Uh, so this is looking at. Symbol table, just an attribute here. Uh, and it's repeating the interfaces, table decorations, table decorations. Uh, properties, modifiers. Okay. Yeah, I think I need to look at the tooling API class as well to figure out how, how it's doing all the specifics. Um, so it looks like it's doing a bunch of different steps here for each property and symbol table properties. Okay. And do we see where it's constructing that symbol table at all? Um, I think it's just querying for it here. All right, so I have to take a look at the uh, Tooling API class, which I don't think is small. Um, tooling API base. Yeah, so I think it's doing a bunch of different stuff. I don't know if we have time to get into here, but the code is all uh, available on GitHub if you want to uh, dive into it and see some of the specifics. Thank you very much. Um, essentially, it looks, mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially, it looks like it's going into each class. Uh, compiling the symbol table using the tooling API, and then basically displaying that accordingly, kind of like we saw in uh, in this call here, from what I can tell at least. Sue did say thank you. Uh, and then do you have mm -hmm. any real world examples where you use Apex, right? Apex triggers or classes in Nord? Uh, I don't personally. Um, and yes, I'll go to the link to uh, documenters right here. Uh, I can put that in the chat also if anyone's interested. Have you ever used Dynamic Apex or the Tooling API? If you have not, how could you use this in your Salesforce org? 
Also, what would you like to see in future videos? Comment below. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you've made it to this point, we want to take an opportunity to say thank you. Since you stayed with us, here's a bonus. If you want to enhance your understanding of Apex, a book you might find beneficial is Advanced Apex Programming in Salesforce. You can find the link for this book in the description below. Thank you for spending time with us. Make sure you like this video. It helps a lot. Click subscribe and on the notification bell so you never miss another video. We also handpick these videos which we recommend you watch next. You can talk to us on Instagram, Twitter, and on our website at 100daysoftrailhead.com, all of which are listed below. Thank you for learning with us, and we'll see you back tomorrow.